Hello and a very good morning to all of you. I hope and pray that all of you are keeping well. I hope that everything is going on well with you. I hope that you are safe uh, amidst uh, all that is going on. Uh, thank God. We thank God that we are still in him, that we have this privilege of being a part of the church, that we have this privilege of uh, meeting online as a church to study the scriptures. So, we have so many, so many unanswered questions and as, as everything is falling apart through the world, through the whole world, let's just continue to pray and let's continue to trust God because God is still sovereign. Hallelujah. All right. So welcome to our Sunday morning fellowship. And I'm really glad that you are able to join in. So let us have a wonderful time, a blessed time, an edifying time of learning from the scriptures and uh, expressing our desires to God. So let's bow down our heads and look to the Lord in prayer. Lord, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for helping us to meet online as a church, to uh, study the scriptures, to sing, to glorify you, even through our songs and emotions. Lord, at this juncture, once again, we commit all of us into your hands for your protection, for your healing, for your restoration, comfort. And Lord, we, we pray that you will give us the strength to continue in you, to be faithful to you, to be obedient to you. Pray for everyone who's joined in. Pray for your blessings to continue upon us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So we are going to sing two songs. And today we have our teens who are going to sing for us. So shall we stand up and uh, sing along with them and praise God, be exuberant in our praise and be excited as we sing uh, about God's love, about God's mercies, about who he is. So let us be exuberant as we join along with them as we sing. So over to them.
swept away And I simply come Longing just to pray Something that's a hope That will bless your heart I hope that you enjoyed singing along with the teens. They did a great job. So today we had uh, Susanna, Angelina, and Adrina who sang for us. So thank you very much. Uh, you, you, you guys did a great job. So thank you. So uh, welcome once again, those who are joining in now. Welcome to our Sunday Morning Fellowship. So we are going to look at the scriptures and we're going to learn. So are you excited? Yes. Hallelujah. So let us look at the scripture. We have been looking at the book of Luke, and today we are going to look at Luke chapter 10, verses 17 onwards. So the previous passage, we talked about how Jesus appointed a 72, another 72, because he already had a 12, right? So they are called the 12, uh, to, to be his disciples, to go and proclaim the kingdom. And now he chose another 72 who were also going and proclaiming the kingdom and he sent them as, you remember, uh, he told them that you are going to be lambs among the wolves and you are going to proclaim the message of the kingdom. And after they, have, they had gone and the instructions had been given, we talked about all of those, remember? The rules that he gave. So he went, they went there and they come back now. And this is what we are going to look at today. Verse 17, the 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. So you find they are excited, they are joyful, they are celebrating 
Why are they celebrating? Because it's, it, 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 it's, it's a, a kind of a childlike uh, joy that they have. Because they went and they came, but they are coming back with good news. What is the good news? That we went and even the demons uh, are subject to us. They can't even believe that this could happen. So they are really, really excited about it. And as I said, you feel a lot of excitement and joy and almost that child-like wonderment and accomplishment. Beautiful. Yes, and they also acknowledge that uh, the demons submit to us in your name. But it looks like the joy is more of the, even the demons are submitting to us. Okay, yes, in your name, but, but still to us. Okay, right. And uh, he replied... Jesus replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. So why would Jesus say something like that? You know, Jesus is using figurative language, obviously, so this is not literal. And what is Jesus saying? That Satan has lost his glory. So it doesn't mean that Satan was in heaven and, you know, he is falling uh, down to the earth. You know, this is, this is more figurative than literal. So all that he is saying is that, as you went about proclaiming the kingdom, so the enemy's strongholds have become loosened and he has lost his power and glory and he fell. And, uh, you know, Jesus is also poetic. Okay, so uh, he is being very uh, figurative in the, in the language that he uses. So Satan's fall has caused the, uh, was caused by the 72 Right? So they had gone and proclaimed the, the good news about the kingdom because of the authority that Jesus had given them. So what did they do? We already know. They went about, Jesus said, I give you authority. What do you do? You go and heal the sick and you go and proclaim the kingdom. So this proclamation of the kingdom by the 72 has caused the downfall of Satan or at least the, him losing his glory. Yeah. And Jesus goes on saying... What does he say? I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Uh, is it literal? As I said, this is figurative, right? He Satan falling like a lightning. Again, it's figurative. You know, you, you are able to get the imagery there that as though lightning from the sky, when you see it, it just falls down the same way I saw Satan fall. Again, very figurative language. Now he goes on to say, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions. Okay, obviously not literal. Why would they go about trampling over snakes and scorpions? Um, that doesn't make sense, right? So uh, the, the animal rights people will come and say, why are you doing that? Um, and 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 then some people really understood it, mis misunderstood it. And there is a kind of a sect called, I think, the Appalachian uh, snake handlers. I think near the, I don't know where exactly. Okay, so uh, uh, these guys would handle snakes in their church services uh, because Jesus had given them authority over snakes and scorpions and so on. But anyway, that's crazy stuff. So uh, no one takes it literally. We are not supposed to take it literally. As disciples, you go and stamp on, uh, trample on snakes and scorpions. He is saying, see, these are harmful things. These are mm, these these these. Uh, are dangerous things so but but I have given you power over that so he is just likening he's just comparing these these poisonous things to the kingdom which is already there which is harming them right because he says I send you as lambs among wolves the wolves are there so earlier he called them wolves now he is saying that uh, they are snakes and scorpions the people against the kingdom led by Satan himself because they have given in to his temptation and they have become like Satan in rebelling against the kingdom and Jesus says I have given you authority over them and that's why you have been able to do that. So Jesus establishes it's not your authority. And as they have already established, it's uh, the, in your name we did that. And Jesus goes on to again emphasize saying, it's not you, it's me. Because of me, because of the message that I gave you, because of the authority that I had given you, you have been able to do that. And there is another one which is interesting. The last phrase of this verse, nothing will harm you. What do you think about that? Nothing will harm you. Is it for us? You know, we like promises. So you will trample on snakes and scorpions and nothing will harm you. Yeah, we, we like that. 
Jesus was saying, I mean, these, these people, were they not harmed? The disciples, were they not harmed? At this point in time, they were not harmed, right? But later on, we know that they were harmed. Some were beaten, some were thrown off the pinnacle like James, some were crucified upside down, some were beheaded, uh, some were stoned, right? Uh, so all of those things happened. So did it harm them? Were people able to harm them? Yes, yes, they were harmed. So at this point of time, again, we always need to look at the context, never pick out a verse and say, oh, this is a promise for all time, for all people. No, it's not a promise for all time, for all people. And uh, it's definitely not for all people. It was specifically to the people he appointed and they didn't go with the, for their, because of their own agenda or for their own agenda. They were doing this for the kingdom. And even those people later on, they had to end your harm and suffering and all of those things. But at this point of time, Jesus says, it's very historically particular. It's not universally uh, kind of for all times and for all people. Okay, but we don't care whether we do the kingdom work or not, but we will pick it out and say, oh, nothing will harm me. Uh, right, <laughs> that's how we are. So what is this that Jesus is saying that nothing will harm you? You will have authority over the enemy. Look at that, he says, uh, and, and uh, and to overcome all the power of the enemy. What kind of a power of the enemy is he talking about? Power to do what? This is not about today, you know, the charismatic movement has come up with the spiritual warfare where you fight uh, some kind of uh, chimerical and fanciful and fantastical, right, fantastic beasts? Okay, fantastical uh, uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, Satan and his minions and all of those things, okay. So uh, the charismatic movement has created a, such a, a sensational demo, demonology, almost rivaling the Hollywood creations. Uh, it's, it's interesting or it's, it's even humorous. That's not what Jesus was talking about. You know, today's kind of demonology where, you know, you go and bind Satan, then you go and lose Satan, and then you go about doing all kinds of stuff. Yeah, right? You've not been in a meeting like that? Uh, uh, thank God that you have not. Um, yeah, all kinds of magical things being done. Uh, somehow, you know, when you do that, all these territorial spirits and, you know, spirits that are somehow between God and us, all that has been dispelled. Now, he's not talking about this enemy like that. He's not talking about, uh, about Satan as this kind of... Um, Oh, what is that? A, a chimerical or, 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 or a fanciful kind of a thing. It's not mystical at all. He is talking about something more. He is talking about you have power over the enemy. What is the enemy actually doing? The enemy wants to, wants, uh, does not want the kingdom of God to be established. And Jesus says that this is going to, this is the power of the enemy. And I have given you power. And what kind of a power? When you go about doing the kingdom work, you automatically demolish the kingdom of the devil. You automatically are taking, uh, uh, taking over the kingdom. You're automatically exercising this power. Oh, that is what Jesus is saying. So as I said, when Jesus was saying, you know, I saw Satan fall like lightning, it was not some kind of, of a magical supernatural thing. It was something that Jesus was talking about. I'm sorry. Jesus was talking about how when you went about proclaiming the message of the kingdom, the kingdom was expanding and what belonged to the kingdom of the world, what belonged to the kingdom of Satan, not in the real sense, but in a very metaphorical sense of people rejecting the kingdom, they are becoming a part of the kingdom and therefore you are winning the war. You are having power over authority, the authority of the enemy. So it has nothing to do with you know, what, uh, what goes on today in many churches. It's basically like parlor tricks, you know, that are happening, uh, some kind of all kinds of superstition and cheap parlor tricks to establish that, you know, you have the power of God, right? None of those things. So he is actually talking about establishing the kingdom of God. And he's also saying anyone who was not a part of the kingdom is basically an enemy of the kingdom. And therefore, when the kingdom advances, that means the enemy loses ground. And therefore, you have power and authority over the enemy. So... What, are we, what do we learn from that? 
uh, that they, they rejoiced. Yes, they had the selfish, uh, 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 selfish uh, motive, shall I say, uh, reason, the selfish motive for rejoicing, which is, oh, we went and even demons obeyed us. Oh, we are so very joyful. But Jesus goes on to say, yeah, that, not, not just that, you have much more reason or rather a better reason to rejoice. And uh, that is why he would say, what would he say? However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you. So he is saying, yeah, yeah, that's all there. But you, 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 I had given you authority. I have given you authority. I saw Satan fall like lightning. And that is what should make you rejoice. Not that uh, you were able to do something and, the sa and, and Satan obeyed you and the demons obeyed you. But rather because the kingdom had been established and people had come into the kingdom. And that's real reason for you to rejoice. What about us? What do we rejoice for? Why do we rejoice? That I said something and it happens. I commanded it and it happened. I claimed the promise and this happened. You know, it's always selfish. It's all about me. But Jesus says, I want you to move away from that. Even to his disciples. You know, that was this, this paradigm shift kind of. They were thinking, oh, we are joyful that, that uh, demons were obeying us. And Jesus says, nah, I think you need to be joyful because I gave you the authority and you took that authority and you overcame the enemy and you were able to destroy the stronghold there the kingdom has been established so if we are a part of the kingdom if we are doing the kingdom work if we are advancing the kingdom and then we can truly rejoice so real rejoicing and let's let's move on however do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you but rejoice that your names are written in heaven so jesus gives another reason now the second reason for them to rejoice the first reason being that you have done uh, you have you 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 have done the work of the kingdom you have established the kingdom you have advanced the kingdom where satan fell like lightning and you had trampled over snakes and scorpions and you had power over the, the, the enemy. And that is reason for you to rejoice. He says the second reason for you to rejoice is that your names, that is what he says, rejoice that your names are written in heaven. So that you have a part, you, you, you are a part of the kingdom. You are definitely a part of the eternal kingdom of God. You have eternal life. And Jesus says you should rejoice about that. And that is real rejoicing. What do we rejoice about today? You know, when many people testify, when we, you know, we have these testimony uh, uh, sessions, is it? Okay, in, in, in uh, Sunday fellowship, during Sunday fellowships. And usually the testimonies are, it's, um, you know, God did this for me, God did that for me. But real testimony and real joy should be, I was instrumental, I was instrumental in, in establishing the kingdom. I went about proclaiming the gospel. I went about advancing the kingdom of God, whereby Satan's rule, Satan's glory has deteriorated. I have done that in your authority. That's what we should be rejoicing about. If you testify about something, testify about what you have done for the kingdom. Testify about, oh, I am a part of God's kingdom. I am, my name is written in, uh, in, in, um, in, the, in the, what is that, what is Jesus saying? Written in heaven. That my, I am going to be. So what does it mean? Again, it's not literal that somehow your name is uh, written in the book of life. In the book of Revelation, you would have that imagery. But again, that was uh, pre-computer age. Okay. So in, 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 in heaven, there is no computer. It's not digitized. It's basically everything is handwritten. Um, yeah, at that point of time, they didn't have computers. So this is how it's going to be explained and it's going to be you know, depicted and picturized. So, oh, your name is definitely there. It's permanently inked there, right? So Jesus says, your name is there in the kingdom. And therefore, meaning that you are a part of the kingdom. And that is reason for you to rejoice. So amidst this, even, even today, amidst all that is happening, yes, uh, some of us have fallen ill, our, our, our dear ones might have fallen ill and, and uh, you know, there is, uh, there is chaos and death and everywhere. 
But we do have a reason to rejoice, a real reason to rejoice. And that is not a selfish reason, but rather something much more important than that. And do we have that reason to rejoice? If you are a part of the kingdom, if you truly are a part of the kingdom, these are two things that you would be rejoicing about. I am a part of the kingdom. I am instrumental in advancing the kingdom. And therefore, I rejoice. And Jesus says, that's how you need to be, the kingdom worker. You know, so may the Lord help us that we will do that. And Jesus always has this habit of being uh, a killjoy. You know what a killjoy is, who a killjoy is. When someone is celebrating, you immediately come and say, hey, that's not why you celebrate. You celebrate this. And he comes with some serious stuff, right? Uh, and uh, he was basically no fun to be around. If you, if, if you talk to, you know, the modern uh, uh, generation, it's always fun and all of those things that we need. And when you come up with something serious immediately, hey, you are a, you are a killjoy. You are f no fun to be around. It looks like Jesus was always, you know, correcting his disciples when they erred either ideologically or in terms of what they did in terms of their practice. Jesus was always correcting them. Okay, and uh, many a time we might not like uh, someone like that, but that's how Jesus was. And he is, as they are rejoicing about how demons are subjecting or, or, or uh, uh, obeying them, uh, Jesus would say, no, you have a better reason, a valid reason, a serious reason. So he makes it much more serious. So personal satisfaction isn't as important when compared to eternal joy. They had a personal satisfaction. We went and the demons obeyed us. Personal satisfaction. Jesus always points towards, points them towards that eternity, points them to the kingdom and the kingdom work and what you have accomplished for the kingdom. And that is why we need to be joyful as well. We too, get, we too are like the disciples. We get excited about these miracles and these supernatural interventions. You know, that's what really, what is that? That's what really excites us, right? Not the dry kind of a teaching, yes? Uh, but Jesus was always this dry teach kind of a teacher uh, because we need to understand this is what really changes the world. This is what really stays in our mind. Not these, these uh, you know, uh, these, these interventions as people call it now or, or this excitement about these miracles. They will die away because miracles are not for every day. Miracles does not, do not happen every moment. Miracles are not uh, the norm, basically. Even though I have heard people today, you know, all oh, Excited and say, you know what, uh, the, the sub supernatural is the new natural. Okay, just like, you know, in COVID, we talk about the new normal and all of those things. Uh, supernatural is the new natural for you. Okay, so no more natural thing. Everything is going to be supernatural. That means that, uh, you know, everything is going to change. You know, you, you, you don't have to eat. You, you, your your uh, body will not age. It's, it's, uh, maybe you will defy gravity. Uh, maybe, okay, just think about that. The supernatural is the new natural. Yeah, we get excited. Oh, immediately. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, what a wonderful revelation. Yeah, we will follow you. Yeah, that's, that's good stuff. Jesus was that killjoy who was saying, it's not your excitement about this personal stuff, but rather about what is much more important, the kingdom. That's tangible. That's important. That's serious stuff. You being a part of the kingdom, that's serious stuff, that's tangible, that's real stuff. Not this excitement about these things. You know, these, these are the ones which appeal today, even in churches, right? The selfish kind of a teaching where it says, God, this will happen, that will happen. You know, all those things are emotionally uplifting things, but really they don't really make sense, right? And this is what appeals uh, people, even in churches. And that is why when you teach a church that teaches, mm, yes, there might be people who come, the, Really, the people who want to know the truth, they might come. But really, not the whole majority of the crowd. They don't really, really do that. In fact, the fastest growing churches, you know, you've heard this uh, word, fastest growing church or fast growing church. Even, even in Chennai, even in Tamil Nadu, even in India, you know, fast growing churches are Bible teaching churches. They are basically Bible distorting churches. Uh, uh, um, ministries basically uh, use something for a selfish gain use something to give you motivation whereby you get all worked up worked up and excited oh oh, oh this is going to happen that is going to happen all selfish never about the kingdom never about the kingdom work never about the eternal life i have a place in the kingdom of god the real church of jesus doesn't focus on getting uh, on us getting something but us having received sonship hallelujah real church of Jesus will never get excited about 
what we receive, but rather what we have received. And what have you received? We have received sonship. You know, why am I using the word sonship? Uh, uh, instead of uh, saying we are heirs of the kingdom because it's a cultural thing at that point of time you know son he, he 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 is the one who receives everything that the father has okay so and not only that not only the possessions but even the even the status even the respect and all of those things so that's a cultural thing so we have the sonship in god so you we could be you could be a man you could be a woman but uh, we will just call it sonship meaning this is a important that you are a part of the kingdom that you are acknowledged by God you have the authority from God that you have the, the the life with God that's beautiful and that is why you know that is what we will be preaching about that is what we will be excited about so let us be excited about being a part of the kingdom let us be excited about the work that we do for the kingdom are you a part of the kingdom how do you know what do you know how do you know? Yeah, we have already uh, looked at all of those things that if you truly follow Jesus for who he is, if you truly uh, uh, obey his uh, uh, teachings, if you truly embrace the kingdom principles and the kingdom values and the kingdom economy, then we are really kingdom people. And then we go about helping people to know the kingdom. So our joy or our sorrow isn't based on what we receive or what we don't but rather based on what we have received or haven't. You got it? So our joy or sorrow shouldn't be based on what we are going to receive or what we, have, what we are not receiving, but rather about what we have already received or what we haven't received, which is basically, as I said, the inheritance, the sonship into the kingdom of God. This is why the kingdom people are always joyful. You could, free, you could look at all the people, you know, any kingdom person at that point of time, uh, not just at that point of time, even missionaries and martyrs, you know, we've talked about that many times. They all had happy lives. They all had joyful lives. Paul being in prison when he's writing the book of um, uh, to, to the, the letter he's writing to the Philippian church. He's in prison, but he's still joyful. He would say rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. Why? Because he doesn't, he is not, his joy or sorrow is not dependent on what he is going to receive now, something selfish, but it's about what he has already received, the sonship. Oh, I am a part of the kingdom. If I get out, I'm still going to advance the kingdom. If I don't get out, I'm going to uh, uh, continue on my, li my life with God forever. So, they, they had a smile on their faces no matter what because they understood and that's how we need to be the real rejoicing. Do we have that? We will have that if we are a part of the kingdom. And even while facing certain death like uh, Stephen was, as he was stoned, you know, he was a happy guy. Look at any of these people. None of them died, uh, died uh, sorrowfully. Yes, death in itself is sorrowful and especially uh, a, die, a death which is, which is given, uh, not natural causes, but which was given as a punishment. And it was horrific, it was horrendous, it was, it was excruci excruciating, it was humiliating, all of those things. But still, they, are, they were joyful in, in accepting that because the real joy is not based on the temporal selfish even supernatural, uh, you know, interventions that is that are for us, but rather about the kingdom, what I did for the do for the kingdom, what uh, whether I am a part of the kingdom. So let our joy be complete. Let that be our joy. Let's move on. And then at that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, "I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth." Because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you, have be, you, ha, you were pleased to do. So Jesus is full of excitement now. Earlier, the disciples were full of excitement for uh, uh, a kind of a petty reason, which is, oh, the demons uh, uh, obeyed us and we were very, very excited. Right? And now Jesus is uh, being excited. He is very happy about it. So what is he happy about? He was full of joy. Through the Holy Spirit. What does it mean? Through the Holy Spirit. Uh, does not mean that the Holy Spirit made him joyful. We need to understand that this intricate and this intimate relationship between the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. And we have talked about two words and uh, we need to remember these, uh, uh, these. Yes, they are technical theological words, but still you need to know them, the concepts. 
One is called perichoresis, which is basically the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are interpenetrated, or they are so in sync with each other. In fact, that's the word that we use, interpenetration. That's they are so in each other, so in sync with each other, that, that uh, they have the same world, they have the same nature, same character, same agenda, same plan, purpose, same uh, uh, essence. Okay, so they are so interconnected that you can't really, even though they are three distinct persons, you can't really say, hey, there is the Father, there is the Son, there is the Holy Spirit. No, they always are together. And then the second word that we have talked about uh, is called appropriation, which is basically that any act of God, right? You're not talking about, talking about the act of God in terms of disaster. I'm talking about any deed that God does, the three, the three persons of the Trinity are involved. So there is no one action where the, it's, it's, it's basically, oh, the father does that. Or this is one thing, oh, the son does that. Or one where the, 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 the Holy Spirit does something. All three are always involved in each other's actions. So creation, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are involved. Salvation, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are involved. Justification, sanctification, uh, what else? Okay, all of these things, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are involved. So here, when it says through the Spirit, it just means that this beautiful relationship that they had, it's almost like the, the Jesus and the Holy Spirit are joyful, okay? You got the idea? Yeah, it is interesting, it is beautiful. So, uh, this real rejoicing is happening. Jesus is just happy about that. What is he happy about that? About, about? I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned. So, what's, what's so exciting about that? You have hidden these things from the wise and learned, but you have chosen to reveal that to infants. He's calling them children, little children. Who is he talking about? Yeah, he's talking about the 72 who came joyfully, right? Uh, because they had established the kingdom. They are a part of the kingdom. And Jesus says, ah, I, I'm, I'm so excited that, that you chose to reveal it to them. So, and, and doing this was pleasing to the Father, it seems. Why would God be partial? I mean, it seems like God is partial, right? Where God chose not to reveal to the, to the wise and the learned, but he chose to reveal to the, the little children. Now, he is obviously, again, using a lot of figurative language in this passage. So he is not talking about literally little, little children, but he is talking about the 72 who are not really learned, maybe. They are not really wise according to that uh, uh, during those times, according to maybe people. But Jesus says, I am happy about that. And it was your choice. You chose to make that happen. Isn't God partial? Why is he partial? And what did he really reveal that he, Jesus is talking about? You reveal, you chose to reveal this. First, this isn't about salvation. Salvation is for all. Anyone who believes in Jesus Christ will be saved. Okay? So it is no, there is no partiality there where God would say, oh, you will be saved, you will not be saved. There is uh, absolute uh, freedom, absolute where Jesus Christ died on the cross so that everybody who believes in him will have everlasting life, right? So it is not about salvation. Otherwise, God would uh, seem very partial. Uh, having hidden things from wise and uh, learned, what do you have against wise and learned, Lord? Uh, and what do you, uh, why do you like the, the, the little children or infants in comparison, why are you revealing that? Uh, so it's not about salvation, but it's about revelation. So this revelation, I mean, God chose these little ones so that he can reveal himself. And then they are going to propagate to the whole world. And maybe even the wise people and maybe the learned people will be will, will accept it. Maybe they will, they will reject it. But God chose to reveal to these little ones. So this is the this is what uh, it is here. It has nothing to do with salvation, okay? Otherwise, as I said, God would be partial. So this is basically God saying, I uh, or, or or Jesus saying, you chose to reveal to the uh, reveal to to the uh, to the little children uh, and the message that they will take and uh, uh, and and people will be saved. Why? It looks like why why would God do something like that? Hmm? That he would uh, not, he would hide from the wise and sh and reveal it to the little little ones. Why? It looks like what God is saying is that what Jesus is saying is that uh, the message has to be received for the sake of the message and not 
for the sake of the messenger. The message has to be received because of the message and not because of the messenger. Because as Paul, you know, uh, kind of in a very parallel manner, Paul says that uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, where he would say, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquent words or human wisdom, but I came to you with humility, but he says, with the power of the message of the gospel, right? So, uh, so that he would say that, that you will never say that, oh, we were saved by Paul's, because of Paul's eloquence, but rather because of the power of the gospel, power of the message of the gospel. So here God is saying uh, that, that God chose these little ones so that all merit will go to him, that the merit will go to the message and not to the messenger. So you need to be careful as to, as we read this, sometimes, you know, we might think, oh, why is Jesus doing, why is God doing something like that? Why is Jesus very happy that the father uh, did not reveal all of those things to the learned, but he chose to reveal to the little ones? And uh, isn't that partiality? Right. Uh, so if it pleased God to reveal this message to the infants who would proclaim to the others, the, and, and then he goes on, he says, all things have been committed to me by my father. No one knows who the son is except the father. And no one knows who the father is except the son and those to whom the son chooses to reveal him. So what is Jesus talking about here? Jesus says that the knowledge of the identity of the father and the son are interlinked. Look at that. No one knows the son who the son is except the father, and no one knows who the father is except the son, and those to whom the son chooses to reveal him. So, Jesus talks about the real revelation. What is the real revelation? The father knows the son, the son knows the father, and not only the son, anyone whom the son chooses to reveal about the father will know the father. You got it? Okay. The father knows the son, the son knows the father, and nobody else knows about the father except the son. So not only the son, the son now chooses to reveal that to some people and those people also will be able to know the father. And who are these some people? Yes, the 12, the 72, the disciples. And this is what Jesus says. So it was your will, it was you were pleased by that. So who actually did that? Who actually revealed about the father, about himself to the people, not the father, but the son. So as I said, this beautiful perichoresis where his action is attributed to the father. And so uh, the, 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 the father knows the son, the son knows the father, son reveals the father to the infants. This is the revelation and the infants, when I'm saying infants, you know, the little children, as Jesus would say, which is basically the disciples, would proclaim it to all and a few would accept it. So the disciples were blessed to see and hear the kingdom message and its establishment. And this is, this is what Jesus says is real revelation. And do we have this real revelation? You know, today people talk about uh, revelation all the time. And not the book of Revelation, but really about how God revealed this to me, how God revealed that to me. And, uh, you know, it's, it's all mystical, it's all magical. And that's all very appealing. God spoke to me. You know, God asked me to say this to you. Uh, and uh, God gave me this secret so that you will be blessed. All of these tricks. That's not revelation, that's not, uh, that's not real revelation. According to Jesus, the real revelation is, do you know the Father, do you know the Son, and how do you know the Father? Except through the Son, you will never be able to know the Father. So if you know the teachings of Jesus, then you know about the Son and about the Father, and that is real revelation. So thank God that we have the revelation, do we? If you really know the teachings of Jesus, then you have a revelation, you have the proper revelation about Jesus Christ, the Son, and the Father as well. And this revelation is very important. So let us be excited about that. Let's be happy about that. We are blessed too, just like these uh, uh, infants, and Jesus would say, they are blessed, right? They are privileged. I'm so happy that this happened for them. And we also share in that blessedness where we have received the message and have seen the kingdom right? We have received the message. We have seen the kingdom. We know about the father. We know about the son. Do we? You know, yesterday in our Bible study, we were talking about um, the theology in songs, how 
Many of us are not even able to discern, uh, not able to discern whether a song is theologically correct or not. I mean, just leave alone a song, not even a sermon. People don't even know what a sermon is supposed to be, right? Uh, because we are, we are in, we we have been bombarded with. We are so exposed to. Uh, all kinds of things that we do not really know what a real sermon is, what a biblical sermon is. And uh, sometimes, you know, people don't like biblical sermons because they're not even used to it. They think, eh, what's, what's really happening? Uh, because uh, there, you know, in a, in a sermon, it's all about, you know, emotion and, and, and experience. Oh, I had this experience. I had that experience. You will have that. All of those things. Nothing like that. A biblical sermon is completely different. It's all about being obedient to the scriptures, about the scripture, what the scripture says. So as I was saying, you know, many of us don't even know what uh, good songs are supposed to be, what good sermon is supposed to be. And we don't know what revelation is. But Jesus says, this is the revelation. How do you know? How do you get that revelation? Uh, for them, it was through Jesus Christ. For us, through the gospels, through the scripture, we get that revelation. So we are blessed. All right. So this is real. This, this is real revelation. We talked about real rejoicing and two parts, two things we talked about. What are they? One is that, oh, demons, uh, sub, uh, demon, demons obeyed us. No, no, no. Jesus says that's not reason for you to rejoice. You rejoice because you establish the kingdom. You proclaim the gospel. I saw Satan fall like lightning. You took the authority which I gave you to trample over snake and scorpion, obviously not literal, and you went about establishing my kingdom and you had authority over the power of the enemy. That's why you rejoice, because you have established the kingdom. And he says, you, 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 you should be excited because your names are in written in heaven, meaning you are a part of heaven. You are a part of eternity. That's why you rejoice, re real rejoicing. Now Jesus talks about real revelation. And he's excited about this real revelation. Oh, these people, these 72, they know you because I have taught uh, them about you. They know me. And because of which they have this blessed uh, blessedness or the privilege of this revelation. And uh, we are blessed as well. So anybody says uh, blessing is this, blessing is that. According to Jesus, this is blessing. This is why he is. This is what he is excited about. Oh, I praise you, Lord, that you have made it possible. What a wonderful, you know, exuberant, excited uh, praise given to God, given to the Father by Jesus Christ. And if we have truly understood Jesus and the Father through His teachings, that's the excitement that He will have about us. Isn't that blessedness? Are we blessed that way? Think about that. Okay. Then, what does he go on to say? Hmm. Then he turned to his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings wanted to see what you see, but did not see it. And to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. So Jesus is saying, and many people wanted to have this. What, 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 what did they want to see? What did they want to hear? It's all about what Jesus taught, about the Father, the Son, about uh, the kingdom. These things have been revealed to you. All right? Then, on one occasion, so we're going to the next passage. On one occasion, verse 25, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Okay, so he's an expert in the law. Uh, and uh, we know about uh, Judaism at that point of time, yes? So there are these experts in the law who want to test Jesus. So Luke makes it very clear the agenda or the motive of this man not to learn from Jesus, but rather to trick Jesus and to test Jesus to somehow find fault with him. Okay, that was their agenda. And he asked this question, how to inherit eternal life? Uh, did he even understand the question? Uh, is not Jesus. I mean, he himself, this man, did he really understand the question? Uh, how to inherit the kingdom of God? Uh, how, to, uh, how to inherit something? I mean, you should be, become a son so that you could inherit. You, know, you should become a daughter. Okay, today's, today's uh, uh, setup. But still, you should be the heir so that you can inherit. How can I inherit? Simple. You should be a part of the kingdom so that you will, be inherit, you will inherit the kingdom. 
Um, yeah, as I said, the question in itself does not make real sense. How do I inherit the kingdom? I mean, you, you, are, a, you are a son of God, you are a daughter of God, you already have the inheritance of, uh, in the kingdom. And how are you going to do that? By obedience to the law, right? And that is what Jesus is going to do here. Jesus is going to say here. And uh, what does Jesus say here? Let's look at that. Jesus always has this um, way of, way of uh, uh, answering questions with the uh, questions okay so that's that's typical of jesus and uh, yeah <laughs> uh, jesus in verse 26 he says what is written in the law he replied how do you read it okay is that a reply it's basically another question right so jesus says uh, you asked a question okay let me answer you with a question what what is written in the law because you are an expert in the law remember Okay, uh, how do you read it? When you read it, what have you understood? How do you read it? Now, have you read it rightly? Have you read it wrongly? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. So he goes on to quote, uh, he, as I said, he is an expert of the law. So obviously he is able to sum the whole law up in, uh, in a few words. He's very precise, he's very concise, uh, he's exact, he's accurate. Yes, he has not missed anything Yeah, He's just summed it up beautifully. So uh, if you have read Deuteronomy chapter six and verse five, you know we find that the law would say that you have to love the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, with all your soul. And Leviticus chapter nine, 19 and verse 18 would talk about how you need to love your neighbor as yourself. So he knows the law and therefore from Deuteronomy, from Leviticus, he has combined them together and beautifully he has presented it in a, in a, in a, in a concise manner. So to inherit is to do what the law demands because the law is a display of God himself. So if I have to become a child of God, I have to obey the law because the law in itself is a is a, is, a, is a display of who God is. So when I obey the law, which is given by God, then I become a child of God. That is how, that is the, that is the intent of the law. And where God revealed, hey, this is who I am. The law in itself is, is, uh, is about who he is. It's an expression of who he is. When I accept it, when I obey, when I obey uh, that law which has been given, then I am a child. So uh, Jesus, uh, uh, what does he say to that? Um, right, you have answered cor correctly, Jesus replied, do this and you will live. Okay, so you already know the answer and Jesus says, yes, you do and then you will have eternal life. You will have inheritance into the kingdom, right? The, the expert of the law doesn't stop there, but he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, again, Luke makes it very clear and easy for our readers, for us to understand that it was not a genuine question. He wanted to justify uh, himself and uh, he, he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? Okay, again, what a bizarre question it is. Who is my neighbor? Isn't it obvious? Everyone in my society is my neighbor, right? That's the obvious uh, thing. So why is this question? Uh, because he is wanting to justify. He doesn't love anybody. And now he is kind of trying to find a loophole in the law. Uh, the law is not very clear about who's my neighbor and therefore I've not loved my neighbor. So who's to blame? Who's to be blamed? Not me, because I want to love my neighbor, but I don't know who my neighbor is. <laughs> you should have been more precise, Lord. The law should have been more precise. The expert of the law has found loophole in the law. And that's how lawyers are, right? Uh, yeah, no offense to any lawyers watching, but if you know the law, then you also know the loopholes so that you can crawl through it and get your client through it. <laughs> um, right, so what is he saying? Hey, I, I, well, Lord, I want to love, <laughs> but I don't know who's my neighbor. The law is not very clear about that. So one cannot be judged for not having understood something, like something, right? I mean, can we be judged for something that we don't know? Uh, yeah, sometimes we are, for example, you know, our educational system. Uh, yeah, we will be judged for what we don't know. <laughs> uh, right, we, 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 are not, we, are not, uh, uh, we are not graded by what we know, but we are graded by what we don't know. Yes? Yes, no. Okay. Anyway, that's, 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 that's a topic for some other day. It's not a sermon, but, but just something, you know, an educational philosophy. Maybe you, you can think about that. So you cannot be judged for, hey, it was not very clear to me, so how can I be judged? You know, it's very interesting. He is not asking the question, who is God? 
because there are two, two parts of the law, right? Love, you, love God and love your neighbor. Who is God? <laughs> you know, you can't ask the question uh, because, uh, yeah, then, then he would have been considered someone who is not even an Israelite, not even a God-fearing person. So now he has this question, who's my neighbor? He didn't want to love anyone but himself, and now he has found a justification, just like we do, right? We don't want to do that, but then we will find a justification. And Jesus answered, look at this, in reply Jesus said, so Jesus answers, earlier Jesus answered with a, a question, with a question, and now Jesus answers him with a story. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, uh, bet him, or, uh, and, and, and went away, leaving him half dead. A uh, priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, pass by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and, they, and, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? Okay. So the question was, who's my neighbor? And now Jesus answers with a whole story. So he's made up a story, uh, you know, at this, in, in this part of the moment, kind of, right? So he's very creative, I guess, right? So he's able to just make up a story, uh, uh, an allegory. I mean, I mean, it's not an allegory. The story is not an allegory, but kind of a parable, right? So he just comes up with the story. And, uh, you know, we need to understand that this is uh, not an allegory because there are a lot of, uh, you know, very creative uh, allegorical preachers who have really uh, uh, come up with crazy stuff which has nothing to do with this. You know, you know about uh, how Jesus is called the Good Samaritan? You know that? Yeah. Um, it's, is it biblical? Nah, really. You know, Jesus is not talking about himself. When someone says, who's my neighbor? And then Jesus says, you know, there was this man who went from Jerusalem to Jericho. All this happened, but I came and I did this. Okay. You know, you know, this allegorical stuff uh, about how the Samaritan is Jesus and how the, um, you know, what's that? The, the wine is his blood and maybe the oil is the anointing that he gives. Uh, how, uh, uh, what else? Uh, yes, he, he has this uh, uh, donkey on which he takes, uh, I don't know about what the donkey means. Then he takes the, the guy to the inn, keep, the inn, and what is the inn? The inn is basically the church. So who's the guy who went from Jerusalem to Jericho? Oh, he is basically, Jerusalem is a holy city. Jericho is a sinful city, all kinds of fancy interpretations. So basically from Jerusalem to Jericho, so a man goes that way from holiness to sin. What happens? You know, robbers come and, uh, and, and uh, take off, take, uh, uh, and they come and beat him, and they take away his clothes. What does it mean? You know, that's Satan who comes and does all kinds of things. And what's this cloth? You know, it's basically salvation because you pick a verse from somewhere which says <laughs> the robe of salvation or something like that. Hey, they take away your salvation. And then, you know, Levite comes, a priest comes. No one really cares for you. No one can help you. But there comes the good Samaritan Jesus. He shed his blood for you. He anoints you. He takes you to the inn, which is basically the church. And the innkeeper, who is basically the pastor. And God and Jesus says, okay, if you, you, you take care of this, uh, uh, you know, guy until I come again. So what is till I come again? That's the second coming of Jesus. And uh, he gives them to him two denarii saying, you know, you take care of him with this. And what is that two denarii? It's basically the Old Testament and New Testament. <laughs> right. All kinds of fancy, creative, uh, yeah, interpretation. This is not obviously what Jesus said, because the question was, who's my neighbor? And Jesus is not going to be talking about one guy, you know, from holiness to sin, salvation gone, devil did this, I came and did all of those things. How is it an answer, right? This is not an allegory, even though it sounds very interesting. So some of you who have not heard this interpretation, 
Yeah, okay. Yeah, this is also one interpretation that's been floating around. And therefore, you know, people call Jesus the Good Samaritan. But in fact, if you really know the culture, uh, you call a Jew a Samaritan, that was not definitely a compliment. That was the opposite of a compliment. That was an abusive word. And in fact, Jesus was called a Samaritan by these Jews who hated him. And the chief priests and all of these guys, they said, aren't we right in calling you a drunkard? A Samaritan and a demon-possessed man. So, uh, obviously, that's not a compliment. You know, they say, you are not a Jew, you are a Samaritan. You know, that's basically an ugly kind of a word, according to them. Uh, Jews, in all their superiority, calling uh, a Jew a Samaritan. You know, that's, that's a spiteful kind of a word. So, just because you add uh, good in, t in front of a bad word doesn't make it uh, good. So, when you call Jesus a good Samaritan, you know, that's not a compliment. According to the Jew, when a Jew calls another Jew a Samaritan, you know, Samaritans are low, uh, uh, lower uh, class citizens, basically, even untouchables almost. Anyway, so Jesus is not a good Samaritan. Jesus is talking about a person who is a Samaritan who is good. Right. So what is this story got to do with the question? So what does uh, and Jesus, uh, as I said, he gives a, 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 a story and he doesn't answer him with a statement. You know, it, would be, it would have been easier if he had just said that. That's what we would think. But Jesus always takes the you know, longer route. You know, he's kind of that way, makes it confusing. Why is he doing that? Because this guy was not, uh, didn't have the right motives or agenda, right? Otherwise, he's not going to be confusing. Uh, anyway, so uh, Jesus just makes up a story with what is happening with historical places like Jerusalem. Yes, historical place. Jericho. Yes, historical place. There were priests there. Yes, priests were historical people. Levites, historic, historical people. Uh, um, uh, Samaritans. Yes, historical people. Inns during, as they were traveling, you know, these were kind of... Uh, 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 places where they would, in, in case of emergency, stay, innkeeper, in, yeah, all historical things, but Jesus is just making up this story. And what is the point of the story? And Jesus asked the question at the end of the story. He asks, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? Right? So what's the answer? Who was truly neighborly? Right, because neighbors are supposed to love one another. So, who was a true neighbor? Uh, and he says, What does he say? The expert of the law said, The one who had mercy on him. And again, you know, if you look at it as a, as a uh, what's that, uh, uh, social commentary, you would understand that uh, it's, it's, uh, it's basically how the Jew is not even willing to call the Samaritan. Uh, say utter the name Samaritan because in this story he comes out beautiful uh, the the uh, Levite uh, has not has no compassion the priest has no compassion all of these are Jewish guys right so the Samaritan whom the Jew hates has been made out to be the hero in the story by Jesus and he always does this Jesus right that he would uh, yes he is what do we call that uh, yeah, he, he, he is humorous that way, right? He, he makes things difficult for people. So he makes the Samaritan the hero of the story. When the Jew, the expert of the law, is putting himself on a pedestal, he says, you guys, now, nah. him, yes. So he's saying, who's the neighbor? Uh, the one who showed mercy. Yeah, he doesn't even say Samaritan. Anyway, and Jesus says, go and do likewise. So what is he saying? He asked the question, who is my neighbor and I should love him? Jesus says, don't ask the question, who is my neighbor so that I can love him? He says, you be the good neighbor. You got the point? So he's not, the, the question was, who's my neighbor? Tell me, Lord, who's my neighbor? Show me, Lord, who's my neighbor so that I can love him. Jesus says, don't ask who is your neighbor so that you can love that person. Be the loving neighbor. Do as he has done. Go and do what he did. So this is beautiful, right? He is talking about something much more important. You know, you are trying to find out whom to love. He says, you be the good neighbor to everybody. Hmm? It isn't about others' goodness which deserves our goodness, right? Because, oh, who is my neighbor so that I can love him? Jesus says, no, it's not about whether they deserve to be loved and whether they deserve to uh, have good things done, been done to them. 
but it's about whether you are able to do that. It's our goodness immaterial of others' goodness. Okay? We also have this question. Are they worthy of this goodness? Then I will be good. Jesus says immaterial of whether they deserve that or not. You be the good person. And then he says if you do that, because the question in itself was... How do I inherit the kingdom? Jesus says, this is how you inherit the kingdom. The Samaritan was a better neighbor than the priest and the Levite. So as I said, it's, a, it's not just a social commentary, but it's, almost, it's, always, it's also a call that Jesus gives saying, go do the same. So this is, a, yes, we are able to understand the humor. We are able to understand the uh, um, irony of the, of the question that this man asked. We are able to understand the social system that was there as a social uh, kind of, a, uh, what is that, commentary. But it's also a call where it says, you go and do likewise. You be the good neighbor so that you can truly be the kingdom person. So that's the requirement, the real requirement of being a part of the kingdom, that you obey the law of the kingdom. Today, people don't talk about obedience to the law. We always talk about what God will do for you. Yeah, that doesn't make you a part of the kingdom. What God wants you to do, you obey, and that makes you a part of the kingdom. All right. And the last one, and we are concluding with this. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman, a woman uh, named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. So here we have an instance, a story, I'm sorry, an incident that is happening. So Jesus goes to Martha, who's opening up her house. She's a hospitable woman. And you have Mary, her sister. So Martha is the hospitable one, trying to do things uh, so that she can honor Jesus. And Mary was the eager one, sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening and learning. And Jesus was always a paradox. You know, just think about that. Who's the, who's the better woman here? I mean, uh, oh, worldly, in our, from our perspective, we would always say, Honoring is basically doing something, right? Martha was that way, hospitable. And as I said, Jesus is always a paradox. He commended Mary, uh, who was actually not doing anything, but rather sitting at his feet and learning. And uh, Jesus says, hey, this is important. And he lovingly corrects Martha, the word, you know, Martha, Martha, you know, twice it is repeated. It's a very loving way of uh, correcting. But she, he is saying the one thing that is necessary is to learn from me. That's the good part. That is the eternal part. That's, that's the one who's going, which is going to stay with her. And the human way of thinking isn't always godliness because today we think that reverence to God is doing all kinds of things, sometimes superstitious things, sometimes external and cultural things, right? Or by, by not wearing my footwear inside the church, I'm honoring God. By covering my hair, head, I'm honoring God. By doing this, I'm honoring God. Or that, I'm honoring God. You know, a cultural way of somehow honoring God. Well, let me tell you, God doesn't care about all of any of those things. He cares about whether you're willing to learn whether you are eager to learn, and Jesus says, those are the people, the eager learners and the eager listeners, and that's true worship, not anything else. Not your prayer, not your praise. What makes you a real uh, kingdom person, an earnest person that Jesus loves, Jesus commends, is a person who is devoted to the learning of his word. So I call this real reverence. Real reverence is not a cultural or an external way of showing reverence by our words or all of those things, but by our intent to learn the teachings of Jesus. So we've talked about four things today. Just to sum it up, real rejoicing, not that demons obey, but rather you have worked for the kingdom and you had power over the, uh, uh, power over the enemy by advancing the kingdom. Rejoicing, real rejoicing, because you are a part of the kingdom. 
And then he talks about real revelation, where revelation is not anything but knowing the Son and the Father through the teachings of the Son. And he says, they are the blessed one. They are the privileged one. The requirement of being a part of the kingdom, the expert asks, and Jesus goes on to say, obey the law. And the law tells you that you love God and you love your neighbor and you be the good neighbor instead of us seeing, seeking a, a, a person that you think deserve goodness and therefore you do good, but rather you be the person who does good in material of what others do. And the last one was real reverence, Martha and Mary. And Jesus says, Mary chose the most important one, the better one of learning from me. So where are we? Where do we stand? Do we have real rejoicing? Do we have real revelation? Do we have real reverence like Mary had? Do we, have the, do we fulfill the real requirement of being a part of the kingdom for being a part of the kingdom? Let's bow down our heads and look to the Lord in prayer. Lord, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for helping us to look at this portion of the scriptures where we have been able to learn. We have learned about all of these things through the scriptures. Help us that we will have this real rejoicing that as we work for the kingdom, as we are a part of the kingdom, that we will have this real revelation about the Father, about the Son, through the teachings of the Son, and that we will fulfill the real requirements of the kingdom, which is obedience to your law, and not just professing and confessing our love to you through our prayer and praise and all of those things, but our obedience to the law. And also that our reverence, the real reverence that we need to have, not Cult shown by our cultural or external things, but rather by our eagerness to learn from the scriptures, learn from you, Jesus Christ, learn your word. Pray for everyone who is watching, everyone who is a part of the church. Pray for your blessings upon everyone. Help each one to have this real rejoicing and the real revelation and follow, fulfill the real requirements. And Lord, have real reverence to you. May them be blessed. And Lord, this is the greatest blessing that we have. Help each one of us to enjoy that. We pray for people. Uh, all of us and our, our, our kith and kin, people around us, pray for your healing, pray for your comfort, consolation, restoration. We pray for your protection upon each one of us. Commit all of us into your hands in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So thank you for joining us. And I hope that you were edified by the study of the scripture. Continue to grow more in God. And uh, before you leave, kindly uh, be generous in your giving, your tithes, your offerings and your contributions. So that will really help us with the ministry and the work of the kingdom. Please do send it to our church account. So with that, we conclude our service for today. And once again, I'm so happy that you joined. I pray and hope that you will continue to be safe and be protected by God. Have a wonderful week. Have a great day. God bless you all and thank you.